move. It will make your code faster by doing nothing. Most people new to C++ struggle with move semantics and don't use standard move enough. Let's have a look today at the power of move. We will see what it does, how it works, where to use it and where to avoid it. Hi, my name is Zen and welcome to my channel. I have prepared a small example for today. What we will see is how to use move and what it actually does. So what we are going to do here is create a string and this string here needs to be long enough to avoid small string optimizations as most of the standard libraries have implemented. And then we will have a look at where the data of this string is actually stored. So we will look at the data pointer of the string and output then afterwards the address by using uh, the ice cream command. What we will then use is a copy constructor to copy the string into a second string and also output the data address of that one. And then for the last one, we will move the first string into the second string and also have a look at the data addresses of those. So if we compile the program by using in this, uh, uh, in this example Ninja, if we compile the program and then let it run. What we will see here is that the address of the first string or of the data of the first string where it's allocated on the heap is uh, some arbitrary number basically. However, the second address, so the string that gets copied is different in address, but the third one is the same. So the data itself hasn't been touched by my string moving to my moved string, which means basically that your computer hasn't done anything. It has literally done nothing by using the standard move command. It has just given the same stuff a different name. This is also the reason why most C++ folks will say that uh, the name of standard move is actually a little bit bad because it doesn't actually do anything. Standard move doesn't move stuff. It leaves it exactly at the place where it's currently at. To understand how move does work, we need to know the differences between value categories in C++. After C++17, there are currently five different value categories. But uh, the important message here is you only need two of them to really understand what's going on. We distinguish between L values and R values. An L value is, broadly speaking, something that has a name and can be referenced by name or by address or something like that. So for instance, here, this float, we call it in this here L value, we can store a value inside of this value. So this means that the value category of this is a so-called L value. And the second type that is important for move is a so-called R value, which in this the uh, definition is something that is temporary in nature, something that doesn't ha have a name by itself. So the return value of this function cannot be referenced by name in this uh, program, which means that in this case it is an R value. Using the definition of L values and R values, we can now write, for instance, a program that is doing something like that. So we take the R value, L value, and we assign a new R value to it, or we assign the result of a function. Now, what C++, what the language standard is doing, already at this point, it is employing the so-called move semantics of C++, which means that this value that is coming out of the function won't be at a, at a specific address and afterwards copied into the L value, but it will be directly created at the L value position. So it will avoid to copy the data where it's not necessary and reuse the result of the already called function to initialize this value, which means that even without having somewhere a move in my code, this code is already moving or at least 
taking, uh, figuratively speaking, taking out of the language standard the move semantics to use that. And it's already making the code faster. So the reali reality is a little bit more complex because that this is some special kind of return value optimization. But anyways, this is basically all you need to understand at this point. Now coming back to our original program, we see what we can do here using standard move. So standard move can be applied to an L value, which means it can be applied to anything that is currently accessible by a specific name. For instance, my string is easily accessible by name. We have given it the name my string. And what it does is it tells the compiler that it should treat this value here as if it were an R value. So as if it were the result from calling just a function. And then the compiler can do the same trickery as before in uh, this RL value examples and reuse the value and put it directly into the variable. And here the same happens. So it will reuse the content of my string and put it into my moved string, which means that at runtime, it actually does nothing. Of course, to be a little bit nitpicky here, it's not nothing. So it will do uh, quite a, a little bit like uh, resetting the object, making sure that my string is still in a valid state and so on. But it's basically nothing at runtime. But how is move now implemented? Because it start, uh, it's part of the standard library, we can just have a look at their implementation and break it down a little bit or remove all the clutter that is usually around standards and have a look at what it's actually doing. So this is now the, let's say, de-obfuscated implementation of the standard library. And what it is doing is it's taking any type T and taking then an input of type t ref ref and afterwards casting the result to remove any reference that is there and apply two references to it. So basically it's just a static cast of the object to an actual R value reference because these two ampersands here, they um, symbolize the R value reference or they are a, a thing where the R value reference can be temporarily stored. And this is basically all there is to standard move. It's just a static cast. And like all static casts, it's not doing anything. It's just reinterpreting what is already there. At this point, most question what this can be used for. Because in theory, it seems all nice and shiny, but the practical examples usually are lacking. So one thing that can be improved by using move is the swap functionality. So as any undergrad probably needed to implement in his days is a swap functionality based on references. So we get a T reference A and a T reference B and want to swap the values. So after the function, A should be in B and B should be in A. Now, the function that usually everybody did implement back in undergrad was something like we create a temporary object T um, and then do a copy construction of A to T. Afterwards, we copy B to A and then we copy the temporary back to B. So here we have one copy construction, a second copy and after that's a copy. So two copies in total and one copy construction. Now, this is the perfect use case that can benefit from using standard move. What we can do here is with using the same interface, also taking a reference A and a reference B, we can move construct the temporary object out of A. Afterwards, we can then assign A the current value of B and then we can use the temporary object and create B. So here we have actually one move construction and two moves, and we avoid paying the cost of any of the deep copy of the objects. And this is basically the benefit. So if now the object T here would be very, uh, very cheap to move, but 
very expensive to copy, then this has a big runtime advantage over using the usual or old implementation of swap. Because here we are not paying for all the necessary copies that we are paying for here. However, as with all of the good stuff, um, you need to be careful when to use it and when not to use it. Because there are also some bad examples when to use move. And these bad examples I've seen over so many places you cannot even imagine. So the first one is basically a pessimizing move. So this actually makes your code worse by using standard move. So for instance, you have a function which returns a value and now you want to return a move value of that one. In this case, you don't return now an, an object, but you return a reference to an object. This prevents the compiler from using return value optimization and you will actually pay a penalty in runtime overhead to use this. The second uh, place where you should avoid move is where it's just redundant. So the compiler or your code will anyways do already the move. So by you putting move additionally in the code, uh, you just clutter the code, make it less readable, and uh, you show that everybody who is reading code yet you didn't really understand what move is doing. So for instance, uh, here, what we see here is we have a specific struct where we have the copy constructor deleted but we have the move constructor ready. So this call here would always be moving. So there is no necessity to tell the compiler that at this point it should be moving the content of the object. So using standard move at this point is just superfluous, it's redundant, and it's, the, it's just making your code worse to read, but not actually faster. That's all for today. So I hope you, you have learned how to use move correctly and improve your code. If you like the content, subscribe, turn on your machine and get started. And as always, happy coding.